Thank you, Dr. Anthony. Yes, I'm indeed a fixture, but fixtures are also furniture. I think I've been here for so long that people are just accustomed to seeing me everywhere. Uh, it's a real honor to be here today. The National Council on the U.S.-Arab Relations work has never been more important than it is today. Dr. Anthony, your efforts to build bridges between the U.S. and the Arab world has never been more critical. We are incredibly appreciative and grateful for all the efforts you do to make this relationship more prosperous. General McKenzie, congratulations on your appointment as the 14th Commander of Central Command. And welcome back to the Middle East. There is no time, place, or circumstance that is more demanding of your proven judgment, experience, and commitment. You lead a group of men and women who do the hard work every single day, delivering on the mission to make the region and the world more secure and more peaceful. Today, that mission is being tested in more ways than ever before. But I want to be absolutely clear that the UAE stands with you in that mission. In multiple theaters and through regular training exercises, encountering terrorism and maintaining the freedom of navigation, the UAE and the US continue to be true partners. Even as we strengthen defense and military cooperation, the UAE will continue to make to take a leading role as a force for positive change in the region. We will continue to emphasize diplomacy and de-escalation. We will invest in stability across the region and throughout humanitarian and economic assistance. We will promote tolerance and inclusion. We believe that these initiatives are the long-term antidote for many of the chronic problem that the region faces. And working side by side with the United States, we aspire to create a more stable and prosperous Middle East. We envision a future in the region where parents can be confident that their children will see a better future, where young people are empowered to pursue opportunity and achieve their ambitions. As we enter what has the potential to be a more pragmatic, productive, and diplomatic era in the Middle East history, I personally sleep better at night knowing that the U.S. forces under General McKenzie's command are working tirelessly to achieve the exact same goal. General, you are an unflagging friend of the UAE and of the region. It's both reassuring and comforting to have you in command at Central Command. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcome General Kenneth McKenzie. Assalamu alaikum. Dr. Anthony, thank you for inviting me to speak today. I uh, really appreciate the opportunity. And before I begin my prepared remarks, let me just say that two days ago, I was in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, uh, where I spent the day at a CHOD conference hosted by General Rawaili, the Chief of Defense of Saudi Arabia, where we had uh, 18 Chiefs of Defense or their representatives present. And we had the opportunity to talk about problems in the region and to recognize that a collective approach is what is best required to meet the challenges of the region. So that was a very productive, uh, there was a very productive visit in Saudi Arabia. Finished it, uh, flew overnight, arrived here yesterday at 6 o'clock, made nine hill calls yesterday. And, uh, and here I am today, a, a little bit the worse for wear, but uh, I will leave you here a little bit later, go back to my headquarters at Tampa and, uh, and pick up where I left off. So I, li I live a pretty busy life, but it's also a very rewarding life, principally because of the people that you have the opportunity to, to come in contact with. And the people seated in this room are representative of that fine group of people. And that's why I wanted to keep this, uh, I wanted to keep this speaking engagement. I felt it was critical that I keep this speaking engagement. So whatever else my schedule devolved into, whatever disaster was inflicted upon me in terms of scheduling, I just wanted to be here today in order to give these remarks. So uh, these are tense and trying times, much of the Middle East. And forums like these are important because they provide a valuable opportunity for us to come together discuss the past and present in order to plot a meaningful, fruitful way forward for us all. I'd like to take just a minute to acknowledge the preceding panel. It's one thing to be uh, keenly aware of the challenging complexities of the U.S.-Arab relationship. It's quite another to expound on them with the depth and appreciable eloquence that the prior panel had. And I appreciate them setting the stage for me. 
For my part, my remarks today are going to be about the military aspect of the problem, providing stability and security, and the importance of cooperation and deterrence. I'll do my best to be brief, armed with the knowledge that I'm the last person standing between you and a networking luncheon. I want to start my, uh, my remarks by talking about the reality of U.S. military in the posture, U.S. military posture in the Middle East and my assessment of the way ahead. Many of you are well steeped in national security issues and are therefore familiar with the national security strategy and the national defense strategy of the United States. Nearly two years after publication of these documents, however, there remains some debate about what it means for our friends for our allies and how these documents manifest themselves on a daily basis across the globe and in particular in the U.S. Central Command area of responsibility. So in a prior life, I was the J-5, what we call the big J-5 on the Joint Staff, and after that I was the director of the Joint Staff. So those two jobs gave me an opportunity to use an old phrase to be present at the creation of both the NSS and the NDS, and I'm going to refer to them in shorthand from now on. So I'm really intimately familiar with those documents, the strategic view they, they, they lay out, and the rationale behind it. Um, I understand why we're going after the long-term objectives of the NSS and recognize that the NDS, in turn, is a clear-eyed appraisal of the threats that we have, uh, that we face, an acknowledgment of the changing character of warfare, in an understanding that future challenges and current challenges to U.S. national interests are transregional, not regional. What, is it, what does it mean when I say clear-eyed appraisal? It, it means, and this is reflected in the documents I just recognized, we realize that if we didn't begin to make some fundamental changes, we might lack the ability in five to seven years to project power when and where needed in order to protect our vital national interests. And by the way, today, nearly two years later, almost every defense expert would agree that that was the correct assessment. The NDS acknowledges that over the last two decades, our principal competitors and potential adversaries, Russia and China, have carefully studied us while, we've been while we have been engaged in counterinsurgency combat, principally in the CENTCOM area of responsibility. They've looked at what they perceive to be our vulnerabilities, and they have developed capabilities that are designed specifically to disrupt our ability to project power and to operate freely across every domain. In effect, they've used that opportunity to steal a march, making their investments based on a very careful study of us. And during all that time, they've had the opportunity to spend precious resources. They have not had the requirement to spend precious resources the way we've had focused on a, on a counterinsurgency campaign that has lasted a very long time. So they've been able to achieve a focus uh, uniquely against our weaknesses while we have had our focus on other things. Today, the strategic environment is extraordinarily complex and volatile. Recent events along the Turkey-Syria border only underscore that point. But despite the dynamism in the central region, the threats to our national interest outlined in the NDS remain clear. China and Russia are the primary challenges. The pacers, if you will, with which we must contend, along with North Korea, Iran, and the persistent threat of violent extremism. Now you may say, doesn't the recent tension with Iran change those priorities? Shouldn't we restack the deck to focus on them? The short answer to that question is no, we should not. But as H.L. Mencken said, there's always a well-known solution to every human problem, neat, plausible, and wrong. In this case, it's better to say no, but a global power doesn't have the luxury of a single strategic focus. In fact, the definition of a global power should infer that it can balance multiple priorities and competing tasks. Iran is one of those priorities. It's not the most important one. The national security strategy clearly states that the United States must work with partners to neutralize Iran's malign activities in the region. And while that's only one aspect of the NSS, it's, it's not a polite suggestion. It's a directive, a directive for the Department of Defense and my command as the operational extension of that. And as the CENTCOM commander, I'll be very clear as I reinforce this point, achieving and maintaining deterrence against Iran is a key task for us. We don't seek war with Iran, but we will not turn away from Iran either. Having said that, 
adversarial great powers that possess the power and the means to destroy our country remain our top concern. So let me say again, as I, just, just to make my position perfectly clear, nothing is as important as our approach to China and then Russia, but we don't have the luxury of focusing solely on those problems. Our planning has to embrace a global perspective. It has to look at challenges from all aspects and enable execution of global, truly global military campaigns. As the director of the Joint Staff and as the J-5, I learned to think about warfare on the surface of a globe. You cannot focus on a region. You must think about the entirety of the whole in order to apply resources to a part of the problem. We have to manage the force in a manner that allows us to meet day-to-day -day requirements while maintaining the flexibility in the force to respond to major contingencies and to prepare for the unexpected. The key concept, again, is global. I don't think it, it comes as a surprise to anybody in this room when I say that conflict has changed. The nature of it has changed over the past decade. Any major fight we're going to be involved in is in all likelihood going to be trans-regional, not regional. It won't be isolated to CENTCOM, UCOM, or Indo-PACOM. It will cut across multiple combatant commands and involve all domains, air, land, sea, space, cyber. Our global fight against ISIS and other violent extremist organizations is a constant reminder how we need to look beyond the illusion of physical or formal boundaries to address the larger threat. So we have to look at how we posture ourselves globally because we simply don't have sufficient resources to be where we want to be in the right numbers all the time. So I have a renewed appreciation for that now that I'm a combatant commander and I have troops in contact every day. But I also acknowledge and appreciate that you can't make global decisions from the perspective of a single combatant commander. Only the Secretary of Defense can make those decisions. And it's the responsibility of the Secretary of Defense, assisted by his staff and by the chairman and the joint staff, to ensure that we are globally correctly postured and that the globe is set in accordance with our nation's strategic priorities, not just a particular combatant command. Let me put that into a practical perspective. Back in May, when we saw a very credible threat stream emerge against us and our partners and allies in the Central Command region, I asked for reinforcements. After considering the global implications of reinforcing Central Command, the Secretary approved moving forces into our region. And I believe, as I speak to you today, I believe that has had some effect on limiting Iran's actions. I cite this as an example because from a practical standpoint, we simply don't have the luxury any longer to have stovepiped ownerships, ownership of our nation's strategic assets. Properly positioned, these assets, particularly those with true global mobility like aircraft carriers, can provide capabilities and deterrence across multiple adversaries and threats. So in the NDS, we have a term called dynamic force employment. This construct sets the globe with the ability to project power wherever needed to safeguard our national interests and those of our allies and partners. Setting that right balance is an extremely, in fact, it's an exquisitely difficult task. The Secretary of Defense has to decide where and how he's going to position forces, armed with the best military advice of his staff, the chairman, the Joint Chiefs, and ultimately the, the ten combatant commanders, of which I am one, all with our national interests firmly in mind. He doesn't have the luxury of a certain strategic environment. Uncertainty plays a large role, and the price of being wrong can be very high. On a smaller scale, each combatant commander must make similar decisions, decisions regarding how they allocate the resources provided them by the secretary to accomplish their own assigned missions. So let me sort of transition and, and go more directly to CENTCOM. The CENTCOM challenges and priorities and how we're going to need to posture in order to address those challenges within the central command area of responsibility. First of all, Everyone recognizes the strategic importance of CENTCOM and the central region to our national interests. There are four aspects I would propose that argue why we need to remain here to preserve them. First, we must not allow another attack on our homeland. The CENTCOM area of responsibility is the world's epicenter for terrorism and violent extremist organizations. The 9-11 attacks based from al-Qaeda's safe haven in Afghanistan was our wake-up call that terrorism could be exported from anywhere in the world and touch us directly here. Second, 
we cannot allow either violent extremist organizations or rogue nations to acquire weapons of mass destruction. Our active presence in this region prevents VEOs from coming together for that purpose and helps prevent the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction material. Third, instability is contagious. It does not respect national borders and grows and spreads if left unchecked. A stable Middle East underpins a stable world. In an already volatile region, our steady commitment to our allies, friends, and partners provides a, a, a force for stability. The fourth reason is the reemergence of great power competition, the main challenge being highlighted in the NDS. China and Russia seek to dominate and influence not just their own geographic regions and their own near abroads, but the central region as well. Just as great power competition looked to influence energy and trade in the Middle East following the First World War, China and Russia are working very hard today to reshuffle the balance of power in the CENTCOM area of responsibility, trying to displace the U.S. from its position of influence in the region. So we understand the adjustments in global force posture may force us to accept greater risk in the central command area of responsibility. What we approach that role and our role with intellectual agility and determination, acknowledging the priorities and our missions are outlined in the NSS and the NDS, knowing that central command is not going to be and cannot be the main effort of our nation's scarce resources all the time. We recognize this proposition and are prepared to work within it. But I want to go back just a little bit and talk about the second and third points I made a moment ago about weapons of mass destruction and regional instability. The long-term challenge we face in the Central Command Theater is Iran. This is highlighted in both the national security strategy and the national defense strategy. The Iranian regime's quest for nuclear weapons, their hegemonic ambitions, their misbehavior, and their threats to us and our partners in the region have been consistent elements of their policy for many years. So as I set my priorities for Central Command, it should come as no surprise that deterring Iran from its destructive and destabilizing activities in the military domain is my top priority. Until such a time as the Iranian regime decides it wants to operate like a responsible state, we must work to establish and reestablish, where necessary, military deterrence with Iran. Understanding that within the context of the ongoing economic and diplomatic maximum pressure campaign. So here's how, to, here's how we do this in just a little bit of, little bit of history. Uh, in, for, in, from the Iranian position, in the absence of any economic or diplomatic leverage to counter the U.S. maximum pressure campaign, sometime late this spring, the Iranian regime made the deliberate choice to push back against the weight of U.S. economic and diplomatic pressure by pursuing potentially military options against the United States or our partners. Their calculus probably rested to some degree on the misperception that the drawdown of forces in the theater signaled US, a flagging U.S. commitment. Of course, nothing could be further from the truth, but we can't be responsible for Iranian misinterpretation of that. The forces we have brought into the theater from May until now, coupled with the aggressive use of our reconnaissance assets, have been key to reestablishing a shaky equilibrium with Iran. Reconnaissance assets are important because they shine a light on malign activities. They provide attribution when something happens. Uh, and people who operate in the dark typically don't like the bright light of ISR to be shined upon them. And so that's what ISR brings us, is the capability to do that. So we've been very aggressive in the employment of that ISR. Since, since May, as you all know, we've transitioned from periods of tactical warning to some Iranian actual attacks. Ship seizures in the Gulf, sustained, sustained attacks from Yemen into Saudi Arabia, and the recent unprecedented cruise missile and U.S. attack in Saudi Arabia. I'm also absolutely convinced that had we not improved our force posture and put steady eyes on Iran, the IRGC or proxies would have done something even worse than this, even worse than the attacks that have developed to date. Today, we continue to monitor the threat of Iranian-sponsored attacks against our partners and against U.S. forces across the region and assess they're still ready to attack if directed by Iranian leadership. We have given them pause in this regard and it's an aphorism of defense policy that, you know, it's hard to measure defense, or correction, pardon me, it's hard to measure deterrence until it fails. 
And then it's very clear. You can always see it in the rearview mirror that, we, that our deterrence posture has failed and we're at another level of conflict. The great difficulty is establishing a deterrence posture that you can, in thinking what you can do and how you, what you can do, what you can say and how you can act to establish deterrence without being needlessly provocative. And that's a challenge. And that's a great challenge that we try to work every day with our friends and partners in the region as we, as we confront Iran. In fact, our actions may have only had the effect of driving them to choose courses of action that they would not otherwise have chosen rather than actual deterrence. And only time will tell how that works out. As we move forward, we need to recognize that so long as we pursue a maximum pressure campaign against Iran, the military element of power, which I am responsible for to the Secretary, must be able to deter Iran from using its military means to counter our actions in the economic and diplomatic domains. As we adjust our posture to meet these ends, we need to arrive at a solution that is sustainable, that has the ability to deter Iran without provocation, and it's adaptable to future and emerging Iranian threats, because those new threats will emerge and they will be different than the ones they are today. This is higher level calculus. This is difficult stuff to, to, to figure out. Deterrence theory, as I've already noted, it really isn't an exact science. There are several aspects we need to consider and assumptions that you have to make against your opponent, you may end up, if you make the wrong assumptions, you can pay for it significantly down the road. Extended deterrence, that is the act of deterring an opponent who is not threatening the U.S. homeland directly, is much more challenging. An opponent, in this case Iran, may doubt our resolve to fight a battle to fulfill a pledge to allies or partners or one that doesn't directly threaten the homeland. Achieving deterrence is difficult, is difficult and is costly to maintain. But the cost of maintaining deterrence is almost always less expensive in the long run than the deployment of forces required to fight a full-scale conflict. Therefore, the U.S. allies, the U.S. and its allies in the region, need to establish the rock-solid perception in the mind of our adversary that we have both the capability and the will to defend our vital mutual national interests. I think a very good progress, a very good in progress example of this is the International Maritime Security Construct, IMSC or Sentinel as we sometimes refer it to. We put this together with the United Kingdom, Bahrain, Australia, UAE and Saudi Arabia. Working along with international partners, we can help maintain freedom of navigation and lend attribution to malign actions in vital international waters such as the Strait of Hormuz. An important key to this effort is that so much of the, physics, the physical presence is not so much the physical presence of ships in the Strait of Hormuz, but rather the ISR, the intelligence capability overhead that can attribute malign behavior. We're not looking to have combat at sea. Rather, we are looking to deter malign activity by the fact that ISR can see that happen and can attribute that uh, can attribute the cause of that. So that's a very important thing to consider. And that's the way we approach the international maritime security construct and in fact Operation Sentinel. And I want to finish on that subject by just talking briefly about the importance of attribution. The Iranian regime has conducted many non-attributable attacks in the past when they didn't think anybody was looking. So the value of additional reconnaissance resources, things that can shine a spotlight on nefarious activities, certainly comes into play here, and we wield that tool very aggressively in concert with our friends and allies in the region. I want to tie everything together and conclude on the point about being good partners and good neighbors. I fully understand that our partners in the region can't choose their neighbors. Saudi Arabia, Iraq, the UAE, Oman, and others, they're stuck with Iran as a neighbor, like it or not. And unfortunately, the Iranian regime has proved itself to be the bully in the neighborhood. And we all know the only way to stand up to a bully is to do it together. As we and our partners in the region continue to work to provide security and stability, we do it with the knowledge that we're stronger together. We must keep in mind that our strategic strength has never rested solely on the volume of material we bring to the fight, but rather on the partnerships, the alliances and the whole of government efforts that no other country and countries in the world can match. Resources will always be at a premium. Just as the United States has to posture its militarily, military globally, working toward a common goal, we in CENTCOM are working with our partners to do the same. With the full knowledge that each country, each nation, 
has its own challenges and economic and social issues that it needs to address, we need to look at defense from a regional perspective within the CENTCOM AOR. Earlier this week, and as I noted at the beginning, I had an opportunity to participate in a conference in Saudi Arabia with chiefs of defense or representatives from 18 nations. We discussed integrating air and missile defenses, securing freedom of navigation, and other aspects of mutual cooperation, looking at how we would best cooperatively and collectively position assets across the region to provide the best defensive capabilities. This is the only practical way to approach the problem. Because everyone can't have their own Patriot battery, just like every U.S. combatant commander can't have their own carrier strike group, much as I would like to have one on a continual basis. I hope that we will continue to build on these beginnings and work toward building a strong coalition of nations to deter malign actors in the region and perhaps maybe, just maybe, convince the Iranian regime to become a better neighbor or at least to be deterred from the malign activities that they have been conducting. On that note, I would like to leave you with a saying from Imam al-Bin Abi Talib that translates roughly in English as, when the people of the right side remain silent with falsehoods, the people of the falsehood falsely believe they are right. It precedes a later Western thought by Edmund Burke that says, the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. Thank you very much for your time today.